Hello and welcome to India's World. Today we are going to discuss the developments in Egypt. Egypt's new military-backed constitution has been passed with 98% of the vote in the referendum held on January 17th and 18th. According to Egypt's election commission, 38.6% of the country's 53 million eligible voters participated in the referendum. The passage of Egypt's new constitution is no doubt a crucial victory for the military regime. However, many questions still remain. Does the adoption of a new constitution promise a return to stability in Egypt? Did the protesters of Arab Spring want a military-backed civilian government in Egypt? And what kind of balance of power is emerging in the Middle East and what does it mean for the stability of the region? I'll be putting these questions to a very distinguished panel of experts we have with us. Ambassador Arundhati Ghosh, a formidable diplomat. She was India's ambassador to Egypt and Korea. She was also India's ambassador to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. Ambassador Kamal Sibyl, he has been one of the most cerebral foreign secretaries that India has been lucky to have. He has served as ambassador in Turkey, France, Russia and Egypt. And we have uh, Professor A.K. Ramakrishnan, Chairman of Centre for West Asian Studies, School of International Studies, JNU, and an expert on West Asia. So welcome all of you to this discussion. Ambassador Ghosh, let me begin with you. In the last uh, three years since the overthrow of Hosni Mubarak's regime, this is Egypt's third constitutional referendum and sixth time the nation has gone to, to vote on something. Will this referendum manage to normalize the post-coup uh, political situation in that country? Um, well, first of all, you've used words like coup. That is not settled yet because the numbers of people who were out on the streets where the army had to take a choice, but we we'll won't go into that. But I think that this particular referendum uh, certainly uh, I think a large number of Egyptians voted for the referendum because, not because they either knew or supported the contents of the new constitution. Mm. I don't think a large number had even read it. Uh, basically, I think people are fed up with the continuous turmoil over the last three years and they want stability. They want a government which will settle down and look at their economic problems, look at their social or political problems. So yes, I think it was a vote for stability rather than the substance of the constitution itself. Ambassador Sibyl, uh, stability is one issue. The other issue is, can Egypt de develop a democratic system which can prevent the military from uh, ruling uh, uh, from behind the scenes? No. Uh, and if it cannot, then how do you bring about, uh, uh, how do you solve the problems of governance and stability in that country? No, I think uh, the history of Egypt uh, ever since uh, the Second World War is not one of any democratic uh, regime in the country. It has had uh, royalty or a military dictatorship uh, right through. Uh, and now, after this so-called Arab Spring and people coming out in the streets and wanting political change, uh, and for a moment, a genuine democratic election which brought the Muslim Brotherhood to power. We find Egypt reverting to its tradition with the military back in power. Um, so you, you disagree with that? It was a coup? Yes, it was. It was a coup, though it might be a popular coup, that's a different matter. But a coup purely in constitutional terms, it was a coup because okay. the army didn't have the authority to overthrow a democratically elected government. Though you may attenuate so was the constitutional uh, Mubarak also a coup? No, Mubarak was elected. Con he was elected Mubarak, all the time. No, Mubarak, when he was overthrown, was that also a coup? No, that was the people who overthrew him. Oh, supported people by the military? No, people who overthrew him and there were agitation in the streets. So that's a different line of argument. Yeah. But the intervention of the it armed the forces same. Uh, by displacing a democratically elected government yeah. uh, presents a very different kind but of But will of they initiative. continue to rule from behind the scenes, whatever of course, form of democracy Of course, of course. The so will they military will is very strong in uh, Egypt. They have huge business interests uh, which are non-transparent. And the new constitution, there is a remarkable provision that the budget of the military cannot be discussed by anybody. Yeah, but so will that not create problems of governance and legitimacy? It has, Egypt always had. Uh, varying degrees of problems of governance yeah. and uh, that will continue but now I think it will continue in a more problematic manner uh, mm -hmm. because the street has been aroused, expectations have been aroused, there is some kind of a thirst for democracy yeah. and the reversal of democracy in Egypt yeah. 
I think presents problems for the future, which the armed forces won't be able to handle. Okay, uh, Professor Ramakrishnan, uh, so there will have to be an elec election now. Mm -hmm. So do you think the, uh, the coming election in Egypt will provide a viable civilian democratic alternative to the Muslim Brotherhood? No, actually from you know, what you have been um, telling us about the military doing it from the back side, no. It's coming to the front side. Al Sisi himself wants to contest in the presidential election and wants to get that, uh, you know, whatever legitimacy he wants to seek. Yeah. Uh, because the constitutional referendum for him was not only about constitution, people's approval on the constitution, it was the people's approval on his leadership that he was yeah. seeking. And therefore, he is going to be there. And because of this deep state, the military controlling all the economic resources, its own power over a long period of time, it's going to be a very significant player. And all that will have, uh, you know, it will create immense problems with okay. any process of democratization. Uh, Basic question, so what were the problems that the military faced after the overthrow or popular overthrow of uh, President Morsi? And does this referendum resolve those issues? I, I'd like to sort of step back a little bit because my two fellow panelists have a particular point of view which I think is, uh, you know, that it is a military, uh, it's the military scene. Yes, the military does control a large amount of the economy. It is not as much as is being portrayed. Yes, it is there. They have an interest. Do they control yes. politics also now? Just one that second. Yes, the constitution, this new one, does contain provisions which would not be acceptable uh, to, let us say, in India, yeah. uh, where you have civilians being tried by military courts. More significant than the one that Kamal mentioned is the fact that the defense minister will be a military man. Yeah. We and we will have two terms. We, we, we are now, we're going to discuss the, the constitution in the, a, in a No, minute. it's the point of the military. Now, what I'd like to say is that when I said that the Egyptians voted for stability, yeah. the first problem, El Sisi's name is there, so is Amr Musa's, mm -hmm. so is Shabahi. Shabahi has spoken out directly that he's a left wing champ. Uh, that he is the only presidential candidate. There is no formal candidacy. The Egyptians, even though there are some of the April 5th people in jail, are in f voted in favor of constitution. Why? They want, and this is your question of challenges, the first is the economy. Their inflation levels are unacceptable. Most of their the uh, Egypt's uh, uh, income coming from tourism or the Suez Canal, whatever, they're completely collapsed. So you've got a really major problem. They are therefore dependent okay. on outside powers. And I'll just finish this. There is from the outside powers <coughs> who have bankrolling the current government has come a statement that uh, LCC would do well to stay in the army. Okay. All right. So we need to take a break at this point. We'll continue so with this interesting discussion after the break. Don't go away. <music> Welcome back. We're discussing the developments in Egypt. Uh, Ambassador Sibyl, how easy or difficult will it be for the Egyptian military to find a civilian partner like Hosni Mubarak's National Democratic Party with which it had a partnership uh, for, for three decades? <laughs> Uh, and if they uh, don't find such a partner, how do you see uh, a, a, a ruling elite emerging in Egypt? Well, you know, it, it can't be a, a, a military government, uh, completely a military government. It has to have a civilian partner. That's quite obvious and they'll find one. Mm -hmm. uh, because if, as is believed, the people want stability and they are willing to give a long rope to the armed forces to bring about that stability, and prevent Egypt from lurching towards uh, extremism or, or the Islamic type, then there are sufficient forces within the system who could back the military. However, that thirst for democracy, which was apparent during the period of the Arab Spring, 
and the removal of the armed forces from the, the grip of the armed forces from the power within the system that will not disappear okay. so easily and the armed forces are not going to be able to resolve the problems of egypt we, we've seen it in so many countries the army comes in they bring about a little discipline there is a strong hand and some problems get solved but the larger problems still remain and egypt's problems economic problems are very deep yeah. partly because it's a highly overpopulated country with a narrow strip of land everybody is dependent on the nile they've always had external help a huge amount of external help coming in to sustain them so those problems won't go away okay. the military also has a problem now with the united states of america yeah. in some ways etc etc so they're not going to be able to solve the problems and therefore i think while they'll find civilian uh, partners to front for them they're not going to yield power yeah. because that's not not in their tradition and therefore the problems of egypt will continue okay. uh, professor how question uh, the very fact that general al sisi wants to contest himself as president i mean at least as of now he wants to contest doesn't it show that he, the army really wants uh, to be directly in charge rather than uh, uh, find a civilian partner maybe they find it difficult to 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 uh, find a civilian political partner uh, as was already mentioned he will uh, you know seek the the help of civilian partners um, um, but at the same time no with know, civilian partner the only mm -hmm. civil uh, mm -hmm. would, would it be al nur the salafis mm -hmm. there the, but uh, you know the, there was one member of the al nur party exactly. in the constitution <laughs> drafting committee uh, who has to say yes for uh, leaving the yeah. uh, you know oversight of uh, 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 you know the al azhar uh, um university over the constitutional process etc yeah. but then uh, the continued support of uh, saudi arabia for for that matter um it is very important for the anur party to play a role yeah. but that will not give the kind of legitimacy that al sisi is seeking from from the people he has to look for more acceptable figures and it it's becoming all the more difficult because most of the people who were part of the uh, uprising in egypt against mubarak they are already being alienated by al sisi yeah. to to a large extent especially the younger elements of egyptian politics um so th that secular alternative itself is not a very homogeneous thing and there is a big crack because of the uh, you know over assertion of military over protesters and other things was okay. uh, gush uh, uh, in uh, 2012 year before last there was a possibility <coughs> briefly of a military islamic partnership ushering in a new era why did the muslim brotherhood uh, eliminate the non islamic uh, uh, forces in the country um, why did it precipitate a situation where the army would have to step in because that partnership ship could have worked yes it could have worked but i think uh this is a little bit of hindsight 2020 yeah, uh it is i think that they were in too much of a hurry yeah. they were trying to do <coughs> things if they had gone a uh, slower yeah. step by step with that constitution with whatever it is uh and not try to impose that exclusive approach to politics political power uh in in such a short period of time uh they may have kept the military on their side the military tried up to uh january 2013 february 2013 because uh, uh, lcc tried to work with morsi on a variety of things but morsi was on his own thing with syria and uh, wanted to play a global mm. role etc where they felt that egypt's uh, uh, thing and their linkages with hamas for example was creating problems for the uh, uh, military yeah. L let me just go back to you professor amkrishan so if uh, if they replace muslim brotherhood with al nur which is a possibility they may have won only one seat in the last election but they may, they may win uh, sorry but al nur is very small very small it's very small so who is the new partner they look for and how do you accommodate the islamic sentiment in the country the liberal islamic sentiment if there is mm -hmm. such a thing um as um, uh, ambassador arjunta de ghosh was mentioning the am um, musa kind of politicians fit uh, well with that okay. and he was leading the constitutional okay. committee 
the 50 member committee which draft uh, uh, which uh, amended the constitution now um, but i think uh, that won't be enough for any major kind of um, you know uh, legitimation effort for the military led government okay. now okay it has to seek much more broader based okay. support uh, the the kind of deep divisions in egypt between the brotherhood on the one hand and the secular elements on the other which we have seen in the june 3rd yeah. movement and in the <coughs> july 3rd coup uh, there the secular elements seem to have come together okay. but that is not the the fact now uh, the repression of the military has gone to such extents yeah. Yeah. that uh, even uh, liberal elements within Egypt are finding it difficult okay. to give uh, open political support. All right. So uh, we need to take a break again at this point. Uh, we'll be back again in a bit. Don't go away. Welcome back. We're discussing the developments in Egypt. Now let's talk a bit about what kind of uh, Middle East is emerging and what kind of uh, role Egypt might have in the new balance of power in the Middle East. Uh, Ambassador Sibyl, would you say that the Arab Spring has come unraveled in Egypt, that the protesters didn't want a military-backed government, they didn't want the kind of regimes that have come up in all those countries where Arab Spring took place? Yes, of course. I mean, I've been saying right from the start that the Arab Spring uh, was a chimera, it was not real. Yeah. And, uh, and that, uh, in fact, uh, it will become autumn and winter pretty soon. And it has become actually even worse than that. The Arab Spring movement, so-called, has been reversed everywhere. Uh, barring perhaps in Tunisia, it's not as bad a situation. But in Egypt, there's a complete reversal in Libya, elsewhere. And now we've seen what's happening in Syria. Uh, I think this word spring was very convenient uh, for the West because they thought it was a rejuvenation, democratic rejuvenation of the Arab society. Though there was some reality on the ground where people were fed up yeah. with the kind of system that had got entrenched uh, in, 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 in Egypt. But the result of that was that the Muslim Brotherhood types, the Islamic extremist types have come to power or came to power in, 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 the, in these countries. And these are not forces which genuinely uh, believe in, in democracy. Okay. So I think the future of, and now countries like Qatar earlier, but Qatar's profile has got diminished, but Saudi Arabia has become the biggest player in the region. And does Saudi Arabia believe in democracy? Will it ever support democratic forces? It will want Wahhabism and the kind of uh, uh, ideology they support to become dominant in this region. Therefore, there is now a threat of this ideology in North Africa, which is, which is a big pity because Egypt could play a very different role in terms of a moderate Islam. Yeah. And, and from there, moderate Islam becoming becoming uh, the prevalent, the prevalent uh, ideology. But unfortunately, with the kind of Saudi support and, yeah. and Kuwaiti support and UAE support and Qatar support that the Egyptian military is getting, yeah. I think the, the prospects are not very bright. So, uh, uh, Professor Ramakrishna, with Egypt becoming unstable and moderate Islam of Egypt not being allowed to uh, sort of uh, express itself politically, do you think Egypt will continue or will be able to play any decisive role in Arab affairs as, as it has done historically? Actually, the uh, leadership of Al Sisi actually wants to put him in the in the line of uh, Nasser, mm. military leaders who can have some influence over the region. Uh, but he has to settle a lot of things at home to take uh, that kind of a move. Uh, so there, there are plans. It said that to 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 uh, you know militarily deal with the Hamas and and things of that sort, um, and then uh, to talk about a fight against terrorism in in the whole of uh, West Asia and North Africa. Um, the on the Saudi part, which was mentioned earlier. They don't want, um, you know, a, a Muslim Brotherhood type of movement spreading into their own territory and, and having a problem with, with the government. And therefore, in spite of the Islamic ideology, you have a new kind of party emerging with Saudi support. Um, so you have uh, Saudi Arabia and UAE bailing out uh, Egypt of its economic 
problems to the extent possible. Um, so, you can see it is not the earlier uh, secular nationalism, Arab nationalism and things of that sort coming up. It is a mix of a variety of things where you have military led uh, guided kind of okay. democracy that he okay. and the monarchies all playing a role where their regime stability is, is the major uh, quest that they are seeking. There is no ideological undercurrent which can have an Egyptian influence over the Middle East. Okay, in thanks, thanks for putting that in perspective. Now, uh, uh, Ambassador Ghosh, let me change the subject a little bit. Do you think US, which is a very important player in West Asia, do you think their plans have changed from supporting public protests to sort of having an, uh, uh, an engagement with Iran, uh, you know, uh, doing Geneva two talks so that Syria uh, gets stabilized? So, they have given up on their earlier strategy and focus has shifted to Iran being the key player, but they are not too sure, otherwise they would not disinvite uh, Iran from uh, Geneva too. Uh, I think you are asking the wrong person about the U about US policy, but let me uh, try my hand at it. Well, I well, will go to the right person in a minute, <laughs> but <laughs> go let ahead me, and answer. Let me, let yeah. me uh, try and say that the support of democracy abroad, while uh, Obama's uh, Cairo speech which he st with which he started uh, the, the, the whole thing, was full of democracy uh, and the support of human rights and uh, so forth, very democratic uh, 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 approach. The realist thing has come in where stability is much more important mm -hmm. for United States interests in the region than uh, the promotion of ideals. So, they have to balance this with their domestic uh, politics of the support of democracy and human rights, etc., etc., and their need for stability in the region. So, but why, I why, why disturb the earlier uh, stability in the region? I do not think, frankly, hmm. that uh, they are the dear a machina in uh, hmm. the region. I think they lost it for a bit. But the Arab Spring should not be dismissed the way it seems to have been. It has left, uh, Kamal himself mentioned, the uh, desire for democratic civilian government. The desire, it may not be there, yeah. but it is there. Two, <coughs> the role of Islamic political Islam is now has to be accepted by any government. This is in the medium term. I am not talking about longer term or the immediate. You have got to see that our interests, yeah, yeah. Okay. if I can just conclude with that, in our interests, a stable uh, Egypt is likely to be more uh, beneficial because they will remain non-extremist. Okay. They will not go into uh, uh, extremist theologically or indeed politically. Okay. So, I think that at in that case, they would be able to start, but it will take some time as uh, okay. Professor Ramakrishnan said, uh, uh, some time to establish this given the rise of Saudi Arabia's uh, uh, flexing its muscles and Iran. So, stability will take time, but let me, mm, last question to will, you. Well, not that much time, but well, still. Last question to you, Ambassador Sibyl. Uh, she said India should look for stability there. This uh, often becomes an excuse for not taking a view on what is happening in the Middle East. What should we, uh, how should we view the developments in Egypt and the developments in Middle East as such? First of all, we can only view them. Okay. We are not an actor there. There is nothing we can do to influence developments in that region. Yeah. Uh, United States uh, has been traditionally the strongest player there. They have tried to exclude every other possible force in trying to undermine their control over this region. When this Arab Spring uh, erupted and they had a hand in that because they have a democracy agenda. Uh, but, and then when the Muslim Brotherhood got elected, they anticipated that, but they thought that this was a version, moderate version of political Islam. Yeah. And if they can be brought into the democratic framework, this could then become the role model uh, for the region and they can continue yeah. to then dominate. So the we are running out of time. My okay. question was for, for us. There is nothing to do but to wait and watch wait and, and hope watch for stability. And, and hope for the best. Yeah. And I agree that uh, for us, the best bet 
is a moderate okay. Egypt because all said and done, okay. Egypt has the largest population in the region. Okay. Culturally, it has the, it's the strongest force. Okay. And the lurch of Egypt okay. towards extremism yeah. Yeah. is not good Quickly, for the region and for us. one sentence because we've run out of time. Yeah, I, I'll just add one. Because there is the aspiration of the Arab people in general and Egyptians in particular for democratic transformation. That's a long-term thing. Whatever be the regime changes that you okay. now see, the ups and okay. downs. Yeah. But this factor we have to uh, take into consideration. Okay, we've absolutely run out of time. I, I know we can discuss this uh, for a longer period of time. But thank you very much and sharing your perspective on Egypt and analyzing the situation in the Middle East. I hope we'll have you here again on the same issue because stability, I think, remains uh, uh, a goal that's still far away in, uh, in West Asia and in the Middle East. Uh, that's all we have for you today. We'll be back again with another interesting issue next week. Till then, goodbye.